Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 358 for Monday, September 26th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How's things in Napomo, my friend? Things are okay. It's turned into autumn. It's kind of nice. We yeah. get a nice little Indian summer out here. I, um, I had my friend Mary Ellen, who I sing with, was down celebrating her birthday this weekend. And she got to sit in with me at one of my favorite gigs at a really nice winery. So that was a nice moment to play that. She's just got the most amazing voice. Yeah. Yeah. And she's a great yeah, singer. You've met her. Yeah. yeah. Great singer. Yeah. And uh, it was just nice. Nice. I, I, my music life is so varied right now between the big band, a fair amount of solo work. I also had a duo gig this weekend with a guy that I just, it's just one of those things, you know, it's like, it's like the way you've described some of the, some of your smaller unit gigs where it's just nice. You walk in, yeah. there's no tension ever. There's total help loading in, loading out. <laughs> you like all the material. So it's, you know, it's just, you get a kick out of playing with each other yep. and it's just, and, they, and they're generally two hour gigs, which seem like a vacation. You know, they just, two hours seems to go by really fast. Yeah. Two hours is, is, is short. It's interesting. You mentioned the, the sort of what I'll call low stakes gigs where you just feel like everything's right there. Cause I, I had, I, I had, I have been, sort of cogitating and and twisting this concept around about low stakes gigs versus high stakes gigs. I had last weekend, I didn't have anything this weekend. I was off this weekend, which was nice. It was my birthday and really had like a nice low key weekend with the family. And it was, that was actually really nice. But um, the weekend before I had two gigs on Saturday, which I'll talk about uh, a bitter pill gig in the afternoon, a fling gig at night. And then earlier in the week, uh, like late Wednesday night, I got a text from uh, my friend who runs a couple of the clubs that I play at with Monkey Fist. And we, I, I haven't done a Monkey Fist gig all summer. And uh, he texted me and he's like, hey, you got any, anything you can put together for tomorrow night? Uh, and I was like, oh, man. OK. He's like, yeah, somebody canceled. I'm like, all right, well, let me see what I can do. So I texted Johnny and Maddie and uh, John wasn't available. And so but Matt was, and it was like, Oh, we can do a duo. Okay, fine. And it was a six to nine. It was outdoors at this place, a new place up in, in Summersworth. I can never remember the name of it. Uh, wait, maybe it's on my (laughs) calendar. God, I should be able to, the the big dipper, uh, really laid back outdoor thing, like picnic tables. There's, there's food there. Uh, and there's like beer and seltzer and wine and stuff. They had on Thursday nights, they have a, Uh, like an ax throwing, a portable ax throwing guy that like comes and sets up his thing. And so they had that going on. It's it's super, super chill laid back. And, uh, and of course there was no pressure on us to have even advertised this because, you know, 24 hours prior to the gig ending, I didn't even know the gig was going to start. Right. You know, so it was totally laid back. Maddie and I got there and it was, it was chilly. You know, it's like you said, it's getting to be fall here. And it was one of the cooler September nights. Um, and so we started at six and we played straight through till nine. We never stopped. We got to maybe the seven thirty, seven forty mark. And I asked Matt, I said, you want to take a break? And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, we can, sure. We can take a break. And I said, I don't know though. Cause like my hands are warmed up now, but they weren't at the beginning. And if we take a break, we're going to have to go through that again. He says, yeah. Uh, when, when I said we could take a break, I just said that in case you wanted to, I wasn't going to stop. I was just going to keep playing. I was like, okay, fa- fair. So let's just plow through. But it was really nice. I hadn't seen Maddie all summer and it was as much us just like hanging out and, and catching up with each other as it was playing the gig. It kind of all melded together into this, this wonderful little thing of us just playing and singing and chatting. And, and it was a wonderful little gig. I really enjoyed it. And we've got a monkey. Cool. Yeah, we've got a monkey fist gig coming up on Friday that uh, with John that uh, we're also lo- I'm also looking forward to for the same reason. But then Saturday, I had a an interesting 
scenario with this this idea of of low stakes gigs versus high stakes gigs. So the bitter pill gig was a noon thirty one set thing at this festival fair thing that happens outside. The weather was perfect. It was great, and you know it's it's again not our crowd. Not we just we just show up and play. We were booked. We play and and we played well. Like everything went great, but. It, I'll say low stakes. I mean, with any gig, I want the music to be fantastic, right? Like that, I don't, when I, when I say low stakes, I don't mean I don't care about the music. I just mean in terms of really, I guess what I'm talking about is filling the place with people was not our job, right? It was, this yep. was, okay, great. So we're the, we're the entertainment and just a cog in the wheel for the day. They've got a bunch of bands and we show up, we do our hour and and off we go. And then a couple of, you know, I get home and a couple hours later I leave for this fling gig and I know, and, and the bitter pill gig went, went great. I leave it for this fling gig at flight coffee, which is a hundred percent ticketed. It's up to us and the venue and the venue does a great job promoting too. Like they, they, you know, it's great, but it is a ticketed event and it is up to us to, to, you know, draw people in. And on the way there, I'm like sweating it. Like, oh man, like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> did, did we sell enough tickets? Like, I don't, I don't I don't know how many tickets we sold cause I didn't book the gig. So I'm not in touch with the with the venue and the promotion side of it. And it's like, man, are we going to be playing a, you know, is this going to be a paid, a lightly paid rehearsal or like, yeah. what, right. What's it going to be? And is it going to be embarrassing? And like, all of those things are going through my head. And, and that's when I started to have this, I'm like, why didn't I like, what, wh what happened earlier that, that this was not the case. And that's when I started dissecting this idea of, you know, the high, the high, uh, stakes and low stakes gigs from that standpoint, you know, the music's always kind of, uh, high stakes as far as I'm concerned, but I wasn't worried about the music with either, either band, you know, I knew that was going to yeah. be good. And, and we wound up filling the place. It was fantastic, but, and it felt because I was, I was, you know, fretting about it ahead of time. Once the place did fill up, it felt great. And, you know, I, I was reminded of what I would go through at every one of the Cirque du Mac parties that we would put on together. Like it was, I was always, I don't know if, how much you remember this, but I couldn't be in the room when the doors opened. I, right. I, like I, it was like, no empty room, bad. Like this is our party. If, if this fails, like it's a huge, it's me. Yeah. what's that? Yeah. It's on me. It's on me. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And every time there was a line out the door and it was never a problem. Right. right? But, but that first half hour while the place was filling up, I like, I just hated being in the room and I, I would much prefer to like leave and go eat and come back and like have to, you know, wrestle through the line to just get in and up to the stage so we could play. And, and it was kind of that same thing the, the other night where it was that same feeling of, of that. And, and, and I think those high stakes gigs are good. Like it was an, Uncom I don't want to say unpleasant, but it was an uncomfortable feeling going through that whole process. And, and we've had those with bitter pill too. It just, that day it just happened to be, you know, a, a flip where it was fling had the high stakes gig in terms of drawing people and bitter pill did not. But yeah, it was an interesting thing to experience, you know, two gigs in the same day. It was like my approach to them. My mindset as I was yeah. driving to them was radically different. It was just interesting. So well, I'll share a little bit about that. So we have one coming up this Saturday night. So this club that we've played at for 10 years and really have had a 10 year run of great success there. I mean, we built the place, you know, and I, I think I told you the story. This is Charlie's. Oh that, yeah. Um, I've been there. I think you have been there. And, yeah. um, when the, when the guy who had previously owned it, took it over, he wasn't a big believer, you know, in paying bands and, you know, not sure where the music had value. And, uh, he, he paid bands pretty low and there were bands who would take it. And so I came and said, well, here's, here's the thing. Good news. I'm going to take all the risk out of your hands. And I knew it was a good, you know, it was the town that, you know, most of the band lived in. It was, I just knew it was a good situation. It was a nice room. Yeah. You know, good bar staff. It was a good room. So I said, good news. I'm going to take all the risk out of you. I'll play for the door. He thought this was the greatest thing. Like, you know, I don't have to pay you. And, and it wasn't that much that he was paying yeah. other bands. Right. And we immediately, you know, started a run of packing the club and it became a, it became kind of a love hate thing because he was happy to have the bar revenue. But after he saw what we would be doing, you know, he, he would 
the thought would cross his mind that, you know, I should get the door and pay them, you know, some, some fee fixed. Yeah. When he, when he did the calculation of how much we were probably taking in compared to what he was paying the other bands. Right. Anyway, (laughs) like I said, we had a good 10 year run of monthly gigs. We would take off in the summer when people could see us for free, you know, 50 times. Um, but pretty much September, September to May, April or May once a month. And um, it was a great run. All right, this guy sells the club. New guy comes in with the club. Club was closed during COVID. Um, when it was time to reopen the club, uh, they asked us, and we played, and we overpacked, I mean, ridiculously packed the place. Combination of people who wanted to see us, combination of people who were happy to get out after COVID. It was just sure. it was ridiculous. It was yep. great. Yep. However, there were a lot of operational issues under this new owner. You know, poor bar staff, poor weight staff, you know, slightly more aggressive security staff. I mean, there, there were, it was not the same club, right? Right. So skip ahead. And the second time we play there after packing the place the first time was about three, four months later, as I best recall, uh, the new ownership asked us to pre-sell tickets. Oh, uh, they wanted to get an idea how much to staff the bar. They said they fixed the bar staff, got better people, all these types of things. But so I put the tickets for sale. Not a lot of, you know, on our normal, normal Facebook based marketing, which is where the primary place where, you know, I'll, I'll do like a, a one or two mass emails, one a month maybe. But Facebook has been, you know, the primary driver for a lot of the stuff, especially with this group to come see us at this venue. And there wasn't really much uptake in people wanting to buy an advanced ticket. Sure. And uh, it was interesting because the woman who was acting as the bar manager was asking often, how's it going? How's it going? Which creates a whole different set of tension. You know, that's, that's oh, a, yeah. that's, yeah. You, you know, so, so you talk about the high stakes. So, but, um, and then we ended up filling the place about 75%. First time, I think certainly the lowest draw we've had there in years and years and years and years. Uh, we, you know, we take the door. So, um, you know, we didn't make as much as we usually make. Um, and now we're up to the next gig then. So this is now, you know, this, that was last April or May, I think. And, uh, and now we're out to here. And again, we put some on sale in advance, really not much uptake. And I think a, most of our audience knows that you don't have to buy an advanced ticket. I mean, it's a club, right? It's not a, yeah, right. You know, it's a club. Yeah. So, uh, they're not, our audience is not used to buying tickets. I think that's one of the reasons it goes on. We have a lot of traffic on the Facebook invite. I mean, that's never, all that's an indication is that people know that the event's going to happen. It's there, not an there's indication. There's awareness. That's right. Show up. Yep. That's all that you know from this is that, you know, at least people are talking. All the guys in the band have been good about sharing and, you know, uh, but, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. But that high stakes, low stakes thing, the, the ticketed sales are a different thing. Then we're selling our, our Halloween one and the sales are going great for that. And, you know, we're, we're, we're crushing it, but yeah. I, and you know, I'm not going to get too stressed about this club because if our audience doesn't want to see us in this club and that's, this is the only way to do it. And if, and if maybe that, you know, time when the service was really poor and the drinks were expensive and, you know, maybe that did put a little wedge that it's not as enjoyable a place to see a band, even that people like. Yeah. And it also seems like there's, I don't know about in your area, in my area, it seems like a lot of bands have come out of the woodwork since COVID. It seems yes. like a lot of people learned to play guitar while they were sitting at home. <laughs> well, <laughs> And yeah, there's a lot more, a lot more bands and a lot more places offering music right now. I don't know if that will, will last forever or whether it's just part of the cycle of coming out of a, of a shutdown is people trying to, trying to grab the gold, you know, and, and get new audiences. But right. Um, yeah, things I, are different. More I've competition. S- I've seen that for sure. That there's there's just there's more bands playing now than there were last year. It, there's yeah. just more competition. Whether whether yeah. there's more bands than there were five years ago, that's hard to say. I don't think that's the case, but certainly more than last year. Yeah, more bands playing out. So, which you know, that's that makes a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. But I would refine what you said about the high stakes, low stakes. I mean, it's not good. And it wears on your psyche and it's a little harder your ego if you don't sell tickets. It doesn't change how good a musician you are, how good a musician your band is. Sure. And I think that's important. I would actually characterize high stakes is when I'm playing on a bill with other really good bands. That that's that's what gets our blood going is why, like why is that? We have to show 
because you want to show up and you want to show out and you want to, you know, you want to, you want to be the best band on a bill, right? Oh, you want to really do your job. So huh. that's, that's what I would call high stakes is like, you know, and along with that is the, you know, especially if it's a multi-band bill, you know, will we get a decent sound check? You know, can we, yeah. you know, do we, uh, will we be comfortable on the stage? Is, you know, all, the, all those types of things. That's, that's the stress part of that. I mean, I, I mean, we play, I mean, I, it, I know yeah. we're going to play, but is it going to be that magic thing where you crush it because everything is butter? Or are you having to kind of like, you know, fight it all night to get over the top? Yep. I, yeah. That, I, that's I, high stakes. That's interesting. So different definitions of high stakes is fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I. I don't, huh? I, I I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, I generally don't experience that. I I actually really like playing with other bands, and I like playing with other bands that are good. Like I I. I mean, yes, I like it as well. I just, I just want to crush. It, it, it is a competitive spirit yeah. and I just want to, you know, really, you know, do the best that we can possibly do. I mean, you want to do that every night, but yeah. you know, if you take, if you play after a band that absolutely kills it, right. Yeah. I don't, that doesn't, you, that doesn't bother me. That, that energizes me that that's like, okay, yeah. let's go. I like, I, I love that whole sort of coopetition thing it, where the, everybody lifts the night and then it's just a, a rousing success. I, I, I don't mean to, to dismiss what you're saying though. I, like I totally get it I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just, it's not, it's not how my mind works in those scenarios. I, I, which is so weird for me because I know you and you are like a very competitive business person. Like you turn over every stone <laughs> and you, you know, you, you are a competitive human being. Yes, I am. Except for this part of your life. It's really weird to me. You're, you're an enigma wrapped up in a riddle. I guess so. Yeah, I, it, I, I, I'm competitive with myself about like, did I deliver the best that I could tonight, or was there something going on? Maybe you know, I've got some a physical issue or a monitor's issue, or uh, you know, what did I take a week off from like playing as much as I usually do, and therefore. I, you know, I get to the gig and I can't quite get away with the things that I normally can do. And, and that like, so in that sense, I'm, I'm competitive, but it's, it's more like, I know that as a band, we're going to deliver and I'd rather have everybody entertained all night long. I like if we're on a bill and we're the, the best band and every other band sucks, I, that's, I, that's, oh, no, 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 you know no, I mean? let, let me, let me try to rephrase this again. High stakes is not is not fear of playing with other bands it's the competitive fire to be your absolute best yeah. when there are other bands on the bill it's not it's not a worry it's just i feel the stakes are if we you know if we if we're not our best tonight we've lost an opportunity to you know yeah. showcase ourselves amongst amongst great peers and it, it's a very enjoyable feeling i mean you sure. get up for it it's like yeah. getting up for a big game right like to use an athletics metaphor so you know i think uh, yeah that but that's what i'm saying high stakes gigs are ones where um your internal drive to to crush beyond crush is is what's driving you. That's well, what yeah, feels like uh, for, high stakes. Feeling. Yeah, your internal drive, not mine. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, I get no, it. it's just fascinating. I I love this when we when we come up with a we stumble into a topic that you and I approach very differently. And and like I said, I, I there's nothing. I think I think it's great. I it just that's not how my mind works. Um, I it does remind me though. I went I, my my little tangent about my monitor's not working reminded me we went and saw on Friday night we saw that Rush tribute band Lotus Land that we've seen a few times I've mm -hmm. talked about here on the show and uh, they played a very not very they played a different set list than I, I normally have seen from them there were a few songs that they played that I've never seen them play before and and one of them they even said before they're like okay you know, we, this it's been about two years since we played this song we decided to dust it off and, tonight and we're going to see how it goes. And they started playing a, a song called Natural Science, which is arguably one of the most complex uh, tunes to get through arrangement wise. It's just got sections that really just don't fit together. But but, you know, if, um, except if you put them together perfectly. And so I was like, oh, man, OK, well, here we go. 
And the drummer had been like trying to get the monitor engineer's attention a few times earlier in the show. And about halfway through natural science, he did something I've never, I don't think I've even done this before. Uh, I've, I've done something like this. So anybody who's played with me will, will understand what I'm saying, but what he, he somehow while he was playing, not just took his monitors out of his ears, but, completely removed them from his body. So he's like extracting the cable from behind his shirt and like threw his monitors on the floor. I mean, he threw a tantrum. Like that's what this was, right? And I that's I said that to the my friends at the to my family and the friends at the table uh, after the the song. I'm like, that that let's all be clear. Like that was a tantrum. He did if he didn't want to have to listen to whatever the mix was in his monitors, you just take them out and let them hang. It's you know, it's going to be fine just letting them hang around your neck. It's no big deal. We've all done it. This was he had to put on a show that he was pissed, you know, and then he crushed the rest of the tune. So, you know, it, it worked out for him. But yeah, it was it was it was a logistical feat watching him n- negotiate this you know, super complex Neil Peart drum part with fills while he's extracting his, his in-ears from his body. It was really fascinating to watch. And then after the tune, he went over and like gave the monitor engineer a piece of his mind, put his monitors back on. And then guess what? The monitor engineer moved the curtains, uh, the legs on the side of the stage so that he could actually, you know, see him, which mm-hmm. seems like maybe that should have happened during sound check. <laughs> but right. you know, sometimes those things don't go well, but yeah, it was funny to, uh, to watch the tantrum and know that, I mean, we've all, I say we, I'm using the royal we. I've certainly had my tantrumy moments on stage about things like that specifically, you know, where it's like the, the gear is just not working or the mix is not right. It sucks. Um, but, uh, you know, you get through it. You make it through the gig and, and you crush it. For sure. That's how it is. So, yeah. Uh, we have a couple of listener questions comments that came in and i would love to talk i don't know where this one's going to go but i I figure i'll share it because at the very least it's just therapy for us all to know that it's not just you it happens to everybody (laughs) including listener jay who sent this at uh 2 30 a.m eastern time i don't know what time it was for him but i happened to be up because you know night owl musician nerd that's how it works He says, I wish you guys had a 24 hour hotline for band counseling. My mental (laughs) health is strained. And there were some smileys in here. So I knew that things were okay. You know, Uh, he says, we have a gig tomorrow at a quote unquote music festival. And consequently, it is one of our better paying gigs. I asked the organizers to send me a picture of the stage setup so that I can work on a stage plan. And he attached a photo of a trailer, uh, a flatbed trailer with uh, sides on it, some sort of rails or something like you might put like maybe cows on this or something. I don't know what you would use this thing for. And it's set there on the ground on concrete and very clearly is not level. He says, what have I gotten our band into PS? There are no lights provided and we can't rent lights at this late stage. They're all sold out help. So, uh, my first thought was, well, you want a level stage like that. That's a big deal. And I say that as the drummer who has to sit and try and play drums, either going, you know, uphill, downhill or or one way to the side that that can be a real pain in the neck. But I'm sure it's a pain in the neck for everybody else playing uh, as well. So, uh, you know, trying to adjust the lifts or something to get it level. But, you know, I mean, I think we've all played on flatbed stages before. And if we haven't, we will. It'll happen. Trust me. And we've all played on crappy stages. Before. Just crappy stages. Yeah, exactly. So I, I guess I call this stage. We, you know, we talked about backline roulette a few weeks ago. This is stage roulette. <laughs> High stakes stage roulette, maybe. I yeah. yeah. Well, I, I have a good story to share about this. So right. a recent gig that we did, right? Yeah. So it was, um, it was a good festival. Like they had really good bands, four stages of good bands and probably hundred thousand people go to this festival. Sure. Really good. Right. Yeah. And, um, the day starts off challenging. The directions provided weren't great. Right. Love it. They got you around to the festival, but they didn't really get you to where you were supposed to park to make it easy uh, offloading. They provided a phone number 
and then you call this number and someone with a with a golf cart will come you know get your stuff and drive it over to the stage anyway and and that you call that phone number and it's out it's out of it's out of business right <laughs> so anyway I'm sorry i don't mean to laugh it's just uh, we've been here yeah we yeah. yeah yeah so uh but i got close you know it got put to a parking spot i had to walk a little farther than i wanted but not a huge deal all the rest of the guys in the band uh, had similar issues, but figured it out. One guy in the band didn't figure it out and was, um, you know, really not happy about it. Right. Okay. You know, sure. long walk, a lot of gear, you know, now I have a rule that you should get rid of all, any and all negative emotion before a gig, like, like, Whatever's going on, there is no infighting in the band, you know, and we, we really don't have those types of situations, but, you know, be part of the, of the vibe yeah. that you're going to bring on stage. Well, this was enough of a frustration that it, it was, it was bleeding over a little bit, Yep, a little bit, but then we get the stage and the stage is small, you know, and I didn't know what it was going to be beforehand. The stage was small. And the state, especially the drum riser, was pretty wobbly. Okay. Um, I didn't know it beforehand. And a band was on before us, and they didn't, I, they didn't seem to have a problem, and they didn't walk off cranky about it <laughs> yeah, as, yeah, as they right. were walking off and were getting on. But it was definitely wobbly, and it, and it definitely caused some issues, some significant issues. Okay. And um, those issues had some arms and legs to it. You know, one guy in the band said, yeah, I don't want to play that festival again. And, what, and one guy me, in, in your in, band, not, not the in my before. band. Got it. Yeah. yeah okay. That stage, that stage wasn't good. Yeah. That was pretty insensitive of them to provide such a crappy stage. Right. You know, I don't want to play that festival again. Yeah. And, and I was like, wait a second. So I'm, I'm going to be in a, maybe a different place. Cause you're saying, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to be like, listen, no, I'm saying, it's yeah, pretty, I understand what you're saying. I'm not necessarily in agreement here because I, 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 I grok this. Yeah. All right. So I, as the leader who worked really hard to get us into this festival, yeah. I was like, what do you mean? You're just going to blow it off because you didn't like the stage? Bad stages are part of festivals. I mean, that's just the way it is. Whether, whether it's by intent or, or, you know, omission or commission that the stage is sucky, whether they were cheap or whatever it is, don't tell me it's not a good enough stage for you, right? This yeah. is a good gig for us, like a really good showcase. I'll communicate to them. And if they come back and if they're, you know, jerks about it, then that's a different thing. But, um, you know, if they get the feedback from a few bands and they're like, yeah, we got it, we'll fix it next year. But, you know, for a band member to say that I'm, I'm too good for that stage, I was not cool with that, right? You know, safety, one thing. Yep. Um, but again, I, and I actually don't even know where I stand on this because like I said, two other bands were on that stage before us and, you know, a contract sound crew didn't come out and throw their body in front of the stage and say, don't, don't get up there guys. It's not safe. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, the degree to which I felt it was wobbly, but I didn't feel it was catastrophically, um, an issue, but we did have some clear issues and it was affecting some of the guys. So I hear that it was an issue. I will communicate that to the booker as well, but I will say flatbeds uneven stages this is part of playing oh you know local local level festivals to a great degree that you don't know what you're going to get and you know i rather than get your panties in a wad and say you know we're we're above that or that's not you're you're not good enough for us i i think it's just part of the deal great crowd super crowd paid fairly you know yep. all sorts of things about it you know that, that go in the plus column of this gig so Crappy stages is there, I think are something you laugh about and you have a beer afterwards and you say how, you know, how silly it is and you figure out what it's going to be. Yeah. I mean, um, there, you like, I mean, I've dealt with them too. I, we had one at the beginning of the summer that, that fling gig we did kind of on the other side of the state where I said the, the stakes were low, right? Like we could, it was our first gig with Jamie and it was great to have it where there were, there was nobody that knew us over there, right? which was great. Uh, yeah. not that we expected problems, but we were, we were road testing a lot of things. It was the first time doing our own sound. First time for a lot of guys being on ear monitors. Like there were a lot of firsts, including Jamie being there. And so it was like, oh, this is great. Like, yeah, sure. We got to drive whatever an hour and 20 each way, but like it, it's, it makes it so that we can do it over there. And we got paid really well, but we were playing 
on a sidewalk. This was the gig where there were no bathrooms, right? Like th th there were stories to tell and we came and told them, uh, but that's it. Right. And maybe you learn something like, for example, when we came into this gig and I realized we were playing on this sidewalk that was not level and, and there's no way to level a sidewalk, as we all know, you know, it's not in the moment like that. Right. And it was like, OK, I'm putting the drums on stage left facing in so that I can be leaning forward instead of leaning to my right all day. You know, like there were things that because I've done it before, I know, all right, this is a non-optimal stage. Fine. I've been here before, but I know how to make it the the the, the least non-optimal, right? I know how to mitigate some of this because I can raise up my rack and, and change the angle of my drums. Yeah, I'm still playing downhill a little bit, which is going to mess with my back because of my foot pedals and I can't really change the angles of those, but it's going to be fine. Like it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't so bad that we had to just walk out, you know, it was like, okay, would I want to do that again? No. Would I do it again? Well, the reality is I know I'm going to, whether, whether I choose that gig at that same spot again, or some gig where I have no idea until I get there, it's going to happen again. So to say, I'm not going to do it. It is really kind of a a, a difficult I, I, a difficult thing. Be careful about drawing lines in the sand it, exactly. over anything, right? Yeah, because I mean, you're mean, gonna be in that same scenario in a different place again. Now, like you said, if the people are terrible and like not pleasant to deal with and all of that, that that means a lot more to me having right. good people to deal with than the the, the logistics of the stage. And I, I, I suppose I should say within reason, because there certainly are scenarios where it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> it, you know, I mean, we could come up with them. I don't think I've ever experienced one, but, you but know. I think those are the, those are the, those are the sins of commission. Those are when yeah. people literally don't care and say, you deal with it either way. Again, I, I was a little stuck. I'm still not to the bottom of the, of the situation. Cause like I said, two other bands were on that stage earlier and, and the one right before us walked up, didn't say a thing. Usually, if if it's, if it's bad, you'll say something to the next band. Be careful that stage is what you know, whatever it'll be. But I would say lines in the sand are a are are a tough way to live, and and the unknown is part of festival playing. Unknown sound systems, unknown yeah. backlines, unknown stages, unknown start times, unknown parking. I mean, I just think. You know, especially art and wine festivals, these are usually done by local volunteers. You know, sometimes they're victims of their own success and they grow, you know, especially this year. All of them were really packed this year. Yeah. But, you know, I, I would just, and again, we, we had some bubbling over frustration from the directions stuff earlier. And I think that that might have added to the overall frustration level of the day. Never make a decision within 72 hours after after a troubling gig. You got to sit with it a little bit That's... and, you know, evaluate what the, you know, who's at fault. Is someone trying to screw you? Is someone, did someone make a mistake that can be fixed? I mean, there, there's a lot to see, but when you're in the throes of, of, uh, of uh, animus about it, it's, <laughs> it's hard to, hard to make a decision. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. 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 Good stuff. So yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it, you know? We all will, because it's going to happen again. Hey, uh, we got another email into feedback at giggabpodcast.com. This one from Wayne. It says, greetings from Northern California. I am in a small classic rock, classic country four piece band, and I kind of took over uh, set list creation. He says, uh, are there any good rules of thumb to follow? I usually put the good chunk of our bangers in the last set, but uh, we also... We also do two to three or even four songs from a single band or performer. So I like to spread those out as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. And he says his keyboardist got us, uh, got him into us. So thanks to, thanks to you, Wade. And also thanks to your keyboard player. Um, yep. I mean, I think you, you and I both enjoy crafting set lists. I've been really like, ah, the, the set list I put together for fling at flight uh, on uh, that Saturday night gig, the high stakes gig. Man, it flowed perfectly. God, it was, it, and it was, it was one that I slaved over and rebuilt a few different times because I want it to be different from, you know, we're playing all, pr pretty much all our same originals at every gig. So trying to find different ways of making them flow that's still really good and keeps us engaged. And 
knowing where to throw the audibles in and all of that stuff. It, it's been a while and I, I'm really stoked to be back into it. So uh, That's but cool. It, it is cool. But, you know, I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts to share about it. My my favorite thought, and, and then I'll throw it to you, Paul, is uh, my, my favorite rule of thumb is that the third song of the night is super important. Um, that's, I don't know why, but I've always sort of targeted that. Like that's the, the crowd is now paying attention. You're warmed up. And now that's the point where it's like a make or break kind of thing in my mind. It's like the third song has got to be, got to really like set it, set the tone, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but that's, right. that's just so one my, Yeah. My contribution is, and the set list conversations are always some of the best ones we've had over the years. I mean, it's just fun. Yeah. You know, it's like moving chess pieces around on a board until you, you know, get the magical combination. The, the problem with the question is, is that there's not one type of set list to write. And I've shared this many times before. It's a very different set list when we are the last band of a multi-band bill versus playing at 10 in the morning versus a club date. And we have club dates. Yep. We, you know, that club we used to play used to start at seven. And in the middle of the winter, there'd be a line to get in at seven. But as it got past daylight savings time, and it wasn't dark out at seven, the place wouldn't fill till eight. Yeah. And so I, I just kind of think set list to fit the vibe of the gig that you're about to play is the way that I would approach it. I can't tell you how many times I've been so excited. A song in my head sounds like it'd be the great opener to get the night started, only to have not critical mass of energy in the room to play a high energy song. And, you know, we always have a, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, most of our shows are two set shows. So up to, up to a three hour show is a two set show for us. And sometimes it's a one set show, but up to, you know, if we play, if we play two hours or less, we pretty much play straight through. And if we play three hours, we take one break. Um, and um, our second set is pretty butter. Like the, the set list is usually what we're doing for a second set, but the whole variable of energy in the room, people in the room, vibe in the room, put first sets, you know, just be ready to go with the flow. And so a lot of, a lot of audibles called for first sets. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 I have a lot to say the, that whole idea of the first song where you, you, you know, when you're crafting it, usually for me at my desk or, you know, not in the room of the gig, right. It, you're like, Oh, this is going to crush. And for me, I, I always go pee before I go on stage. Right. I think a lot of us do. Um, and it, it is, I, but I will spend, you know, if it's the day of the gig that I've done the set list or the day before, it's certainly fresh in my mind, not just the set list that I built, but the process I went through. And a lot of the ideas that I threw out, right. Are, are still fresh in my head. And that's part of the process that I really enjoy is just having all these different ideas. And I finally settle on one, but it doesn't mean that any of those ideas are terrible. I mean, some of them are, but it just means that they aren't the ones I chose for whatever reason. However, they're still in my head and I've been in, generally speaking, I've been in the room uh, right up until we're going to play. I go, I pee. And that moment of, of urinal inspiration often will change the first song of the set. It's like, you know, cause it's a moment where I get to just sort of chill and it's like, wait a minute. No, that, that first song that we have, no, 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 no. We got to, that the room, the vibe of the room is different. We got to, we got to approach this differently, you know? And, uh, so, so there's certainly that, that, that happens often, not, not every time, but it's, it, you know, 50% of the time kind of thing. And then, like you said, the idea of playing, what's the vibe of the gig? Like I knew that flight gig that we were doing was going to be a listening room vibe. Right. That's generally what this place is. It's a coffee shop during the day. They serve beer and wine and, you know, cocktails and stuff at night. Uh, but it's it's tables and it's a seated event. And people certainly can get up and dance. It happens. People do. But by and large, it is a listening room event. And I love listening room kind of events, I, both for Fling and for Bitter Pill. I mean, we, we each band can do either. We can play, you know, listening room and dance party. But I, I really like it when people are paying attention and all that. Um, it does it. set I the stakes higher. Kids. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so building the set for that idea of a listening room versus building a set for the idea of a dance party, those are two very different approaches. 
And, you know, one thing to Wade's comment where he said, I'm, uh, you know, I'm saving the good chunk of the bangers for to end the last set. And that's fine. Like, you definitely want to end the night on a high note. However, if you're taking a set break, I feel like the song, let's say it's a two set night. I feel like the, the song or songs, the way you end your first set is arguably more important than the way you end the second set. Because here's the thing. At the end of the second set, the final set, you already know everybody's going to leave. But at the very least, you're not going to be playing anymore. Whether they choose to leave or not, you know, that's between them and the club usually. At the end of that first set, people have a decision to make. You're still playing and you want them to want to stick around. And so that end of the first set, I've always treated with kid gloves. I very careful about getting too creative with how, I mean, sometimes it, it is good to be creative with how you end the set, but it's got to end strong. I, I won't put, a, you know, a brand new song to end the first set. You know, I might put a brand new song. If it's high energy, I might put it to end the, the second set. And, you know, things are a little looser. The band's flowing well. But that, that end of the first set, that's, that's, that's important decisions to make there. And I, Wait. yeah. I, I don't know. I like I've always thought of it. I mean, that hopefully way. it's not. Hopefully yeah. you, don't, you have enough good stuff that you can put at the end of both shows, right? Correct. Both Correct. Sets. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But don't, yeah, don't throw away the end of the first set and say, "Well, we got to save every single one of our good songs to you know play the second half of the second set." That's where it's really going to crush. It does. That's you're not wrong. But if there's nobody sticking around to see that second set, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You got it. You got to set the hook. And, and, you know, for some gigs, you know, that the people are just going to be there and that's okay. That's great. In fact, I love that. But if you don't know that, then it's your job to, to sell the whole way through, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I like, I like crafting the flow. I like thinking about all of that stuff. And uh, it's been nice getting back into that with, uh, with these recent fling gigs. It's, it's good. So I got to be careful. Otherwise I know bitter pill. Uh, some of the folks I play with in Bitter Pill listen to this. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to wind up getting that job at Bitter Pill too. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, not that that's a bad thing. It's just, it's, you know, Dave bang drum, uh, yep. Dave do sound. So, you know, I mean, it's like, we, well, actually I, I do sound with Billy, which is nice. We all, we all pitch in on that. So, uh, I don't know. What else do we got? Do we have anything else? Or is this, uh, is this where we're, is this where the end begins? I think we're good. All right. I like it. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com, folks. We'd love to uh, love to hear from you. We love love chatting through your, your thoughts and comments. And I think I found a way to share the uh, Jay's trailer in the episode image. So look in the episode image, and I think you'll find it. I think you're going to like it. <laughs> What's that thing we say, Paul? Always be performing. Love it. <laughs>